You are standing by. At this time, all participants are on a listen-all mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, to ask a question, press star 1 on your phone and record your name at the prompt. The call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Shannon McGarry. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you so much, Anna. Welcome, everyone, to the monthly webinar for VISTA. My name is Shannon McGarry, and I will be your host for today's session on Alternative Lenses, Poverty Beyond the Official Measure. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Pimper, who will talk to us about the limitations of the federal official, the definition of poverty, and will be exploring some of the ways to define poverty in the U.S. Also joining us today, uh, you will find Robin Stegman. Uh, she's in the chat and Q&A, uh, and will be helping to answer some of the questions that you may have uh, and asking for your advice and input, as well as providing additional resources on today's topic. We're also joined by Suzanne Knizner, who's providing technical assistance and has a couple of tips. Um, actually, I'm going to share those tip with, tips with you uh, that will <clears throat> so that you can fully uh, engage in the webinar. Uh, a couple of tips, uh, if you do have any questions as we're going through the presentation for either the presenter or anybody else, you can go ahead and ask those using the Q&A feature located in the bottom right hand side of your screen. Um, and we will be responding to those as quickly throughout the presentation uh, and also addressing those towards the end uh, when we have a Q&A session. Uh, and if you want to share any tips or resources or any other ideas that you might have uh, as we're talking about different things today, you can do that using the chat feature, which is located just above the Q&A. Uh, you'll notice that right now the phone lines are muted. Uh, we will be opening the uh, lines later at the end of the presentation, uh, but for right now, uh, just keep in mind um, that those are muted, uh, and, but that we will uh, keep that conversation going for about 30 minutes after the conclusion of the formal presentation. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, uh, and we will make sure that it's available to you on the uh, Webinars for VISTA page on demand uh, on the VISTA campus, uh, as, long, as well as all of the other sessions that we've presented in the past. And the PowerPoint slides for today's presentation will be sent in a follow-up email along with um, some additional resources on uh, poverty. Uh, if at any time you are disconnected, uh, you can dial in. Uh, using the conference call and passcode number that is located on the screen. Uh, and if you get disconnected from the web portion of the event, you can log back in uh, using the information that was emailed to you. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Andy King, who's the training specialist at AmeriCorps Vista, who's going to share some words on planning your professional development. And, and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have such a terrific turnout. Uh, as you know, poverty is, is central to what VISTAs do, and we're really delighted to bring uh, to you one of the foremost experts in policy research today, Dr. Stephen Pimper, and hear about him in just a minute. I also wanted to let you know about some of the other exciting things happening in conjunction with this webinar. Uh, there are about 55 VISTAs there in New York City at Bank Street College. Uh, Bank Street is hosting uh, uh, the webcast, so Dr. Pimper is there, along with uh, this group of, of this serving there, and they're going to meet uh, once the full presentation is done for additional discussion and conversation to talk about what these men might mean for their local communities. We've got across the country uh, 18 other groups of this who have come together to participate uh, as a group in the webinar, and then to hold discussion groups afterwards. And in fact, there's a group of VISTAs here, Separation for National and Community Service Headquarters in Washington, D.C. So they're just downstairs from where I'm sitting. And, and as soon as the webinar is done, I'm going to run down there and have a conversation as well. So we really see these monthly webinars as a chance for you to advance your own professional development. Um, it's a great way to get together with your VISTA colleagues, whether it's in your own project site, uh, other VISTAs in other organizations around your community, um, but, but we encourage you to look at these as a way to come together uh, to network and, and to do some shared learning. So again, I thank you for making time today, and I'm going to turn you back over to Shannon. much, Andy. Uh, so here is our agenda for today. Uh, we are going to start off 
by talking about what the official poverty measure is uh, and what some of the limitations are uh, with that measure. Uh, we'll be going over uh, what the supplemental poverty measures are, as well as some other alternatives, so things like family budgets, life course analysis, uh, insecurity, mobility capabilities, et cetera. Uh, we'll be talking about what the implications of these measures are for your work as VISTAs, uh, and then we'll direct you to some of the resources that are available to you on the VISTA campus. Uh, and we will be doing a Q&A uh, chat where you'll have a, a conversation or opportunity to have some of your questions answered. Uh, and then um, finally, we will um, stay on the line and be doing a Twitter chat uh, at the end of the presentation. Lead us through our exciting look at alternative poverty measures uh, is Dr. Stephen Pimper. Dr. Pimper teaches courses on social welfare policy to graduate social work students at Columbia University, NYU, and the City University of New York. He also writes books and articles about poverty and inequality in the United States. Prior to getting his PhD, Stephen worked for over a decade at community-based soup kitchens and food pantries. And so now I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you so much, Shannon, and thank you, Andy. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm thrilled to see so many people from all over the country joining us today. Um, as you can see here from this list of learning objectives, we've got about four goals that we're going to work our way through over the next hour or so. Um, but mostly what it is that I'm hoping that we're going to achieve is to get you all thinking perhaps a bit more consciously and in a more complicated way about what it is that poverty means and challenge a few of your assumptions about what that is. So to get that thinking started, what we'd like to do is to ask simply each of you to weigh in on what may be a fairly straightforward question. And you can use this um, in the chat portion. I see that Robin has just put up the question there in the chat board. What does poverty mean to you? What is poverty, do you think? What does it mean to be poor? What is it that distinguishes people who are living in poverty from those who are not? All right, so a few moments, give that a little bit of thought um, and weigh in on uh, the chat board. I see that Susie's lack of agency in one's life, an ability to meet essential life needs. Uh, oh, that's moving quickly. It's hard to read that. My apologies. Um, lack of resources, says Lauren. Um, lack of support, says Andrew. Um, a lack of justice, says Mariana. Um, of means, money, food, thought, a lack of opportunity. Inflation of spirit, says Anna. Uh, stigma from Barbara. Inability, Sarah. Stress, says Lauren. Crisis management, says Hallie. Um, a giant lack, Jennifer says. Racism, sexism, um, healthy living, uh, lack of fair organization of economics, no hope for change, lack of sustainable resources, power, lack of control, uh, systemic inequalities, right? We get all sorts of, of, of observations, notice how that we seem to be moving from, from sort of the micro, the individual, the personal, the familial, the neighborhood level, up to sort of, of possibilities for larger systemic kinds of, of ways of thinking, political economic decisions, uh, institution, mental social anguish. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and move us on. You should keep weighing in there, right, because there's no shortage of things to say. Um, but as you can see, as we can all see, and as I suspect you all know, there are lots of different ways of thinking about what poverty is or what it means to be poor. And there's no right answer to that question, of course. There is no objective meaning, no universally agreed upon meaning for what poverty is. There's no such thing, I would argue, and that, and that thing can surprise people, but poverty means different things to different people, and means different things to different people at different moments in time. But we define poverty and how we measure it, what we fit it is to be poor, and how we determine how many people fit in that definition, has profound effects 
on what kind of solutions we seek, on, on what kinds of programs we might create, on how we determine who might be eligible for assistance. Or as political scientist E.E. E. Schatzschneider put it, as you can see here, definition of the alternatives is the supreme instrument of power. With Schneider fully lodged in the back of our minds, today what I hope that we'll do is, is we'll look at a handful of different ways of defining policy and how each different definition might alter the work that you're doing in your VISTA serving or service or might alter your own thinking about how we know people are poor. And what is it that we're really saying when we put people into that category? What does it really mean when we say that people are living in poverty? So start here, and if you look in the right, you'll see a poll question. Right? Start here with a simple um on, on um, the Census Bureau measure, right? What do you think the official poverty rate was for 2011, right? So if you get over here on the right, um, so point people toward anything they might need to know, or Shannon, whoever's, whoever's doing the, the instructions to folks? Um, we have a poll open, and and we want to know what you think the poverty rate is in America, and there are four options. So if you could please participate in the poll, we'd love to see your responses, and we will reveal those responses um, just as soon as they're ready. Starting to look at the poll results come in and also read what's going on in the chat discussion as well. There are all sorts of interesting observations that everyone's making in there as well. Uh, can we move toward, um, assume that folks have had a chance to weigh in on the poll and move toward closing that down and posting the results at this point? Sure. It's, it's very exciting, isn't it? So if we'll have the results ready in about 30 seconds or so. Uh, we're just waiting for those to be compiled. All right. Meanwhile, looking back up at the chat, of course, what we've got instead of observations about what poverty means is people talking about where they're living. Um, Liv evidently is very excited to be in Detroit. Um, and of course, fascinating sort of place to be thinking about and talking about poverty um, in some ways. Um, poverty in Detroit is a very distinct thing than it is in the rest of the country. Okay, there we go. So we can see results now. Um, all right, so we've got um, a small number, say nine. Um, we've got sort of uh, equal division, give or take, between 12, 15, and 20 percent. Um, and then a good chunk of folks who, to their credit, didn't know and decided not to guess and actually admit that. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, and we can look at the actual answer. Oh, the one after that, sorry. Um, these are the official rates of poverty from the U.S. Census Bureau. And typically, when you see reports about poverty, um, when you read stories about poverty and the poverty rate, the percentage of people living in poverty, the number of people living in poverty, this is usually the source of the data that most people are using, the official Census Bureau measures. And as you can see here, the official poverty rate for 2011 in the United States was 15%. We represented over 46 million Americans living in poverty according to those official standards. So on to the next. Terrific. So as some of you will remember from your version of the PSO, the Census Bureau determines how many our people are poor in a fairly straightforward way. It has developed what it calls a poverty threshold. It's a, it's a cutoff for being poor. If your household is Income is below this line, your kid is poor. If your household income is above this line, even if it's only by dollar, you are not counted as poor. The most recent data that we have available show us poverty rates for 2011. The arrow above here is pointing to the 2011 threshold for a family of four, which, as you can see, is just over $23,000 in gross cash income. Now, there are lots and lots of complaints about this method of determining how many people are poor, 
or to return it to Schneider from complaints about defining poverty in this particular way, using this income threshold. And, and those complaints, they come from across the political spectrum, and they tend to fall into two broad categories. The first set of complaints have to do with problems with the data collection method itself. And then the second set of complaints are, are about the very concept of this dollar value cutoff for determining poverty. So let's talk briefly about that, those first set of complaints, the methodological objections first. Now, for particular historical reasons, when the Census Bureau adds up your income to determine if you fall above or below that poverty line, there's a lot that it doesn't even take into account. It doesn't, for example, count new cash income, things like SNAP, what we used to call food stamps. It doesn't count housing assistance. It doesn't count the value of things like Medicaid as your income. And when it sets that threshold, remember a little over $23,000 for a family of four, it uses a very old formula from the 1960s that's based on outdated costs of living. So it doesn't, among other things, account for the fact that food is now much cheaper, thanks to right mass agriculture and those sorts of things. Food is much cheaper than when the poverty measure was designed, and it does into a fact count the fact that housing and health care are much more expensive than they were in the 1950s and 60s. Moreover, that official threshold, absolutely no geographic variation. So exactly the same amount, $23,000 for a family of four, it's exactly the same amount in Manhattan, where I'm sitting now, as it is in rural Mississippi or in Idaho, two of the states with the lowest costs of living. So the widespread agreement that it's a pretty poor tool. But that's not right. In addition to these methodological limitations, there are some questions we should ask about the very concept of an absolute dollar threshold to begin with. Now, this kind of, of binary cutoff point, it doesn't tell us how poor the people below the line are, right? So if our family income is $5,000 a year, that doesn't show up any differently in the poverty data than if your income were $15,000 a year or if it were $23,000 a year. Right? Below the line, you're below the line, period. So the official member measure may tell us how many people are, are poor, but it doesn't tell us how poor. As illustrated in this slide here, it seems odd to me, right, that first family with income of $23,020 a year, technically poor according to the threshold measure, while the second family, $23,020 a year, is not poor according to the Census Bureau measure. Yet the only thing that separates that income is $2. Did worry, I think that that your approach is ultimately kind of arbitrary, right? What what amount as a cutoff for poverty? Who decides what things are necessary to to be poor or to not be poor? Don't family needs differ from one another, right? What about say two families of exactly the same size, but one of whom has a child with developmental disabilities? Do those families need the same amount to survive? What does the threshold mean? Does it which people are surviving? Or is it people are struggling? Is it which people are just getting by? Right? That is, what does it mean when you say that 15% of the American population in 2011 had income below the poverty threshold? What does that really tell us when all this is said and done? So else, this time you read or cite official poverty data to make a point, pull yourself. What is the point I'm actually trying to make about these families or this community? Data actually speak to the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, the Census Bureau is staffed by some extraordinarily smart people. So it's not as if they don't know this, and it's not as if they don't know that there are lots of problems with the official poverty measure. And as a consequence, they publish all kinds of data that we can use to help expand our thinking about those poverty numbers. And we're only going to look at two of those today. 
first one is this here. So one way to get around this this arbitrary binary problem, right, and the belief among many scholars, and myself included, that the official party threshold winds up understating actual poverty, well, way is to not look quite so narrowly only at how many people are below that threshold, how many people are at 100% of the poverty line or below, but to look more broadly. I'm going to try to sort of block out the area of this that I want to draw your attention to. To look more broadly at the number of people who are below 200% of the poverty, right? Like we're saying, not just, right, as we see, let me see if I can get the, the marker here to work. Right, this, right, this, this 8.4 and 6.6%, you notice if you add those two up, you get 15%, right? That's official poverty threshold. That's 100% of poverty or below. This is now right below 200% of poverty. So we see 15% of the population living, oh, $23,000 a year, 100% of the poverty threshold. What this tells us, many people are living below twice that. How many people are below $46,000 a year for a family of four? Now, Census Bureau regularly publishes these data along with the official measure, and they call this group, that group with income below 200, between 200% of the poverty line and 100% of the poverty line, right, this group right in here, they call those low-income Americans. What we see by looking at these numbers is that there are a total of 35% of all Americans in 2011 below 200% of the poverty line, compared to 15% below 100% of the poverty line. Or put lightly, we say that 15% of Americans are officially poor, 50% are officially low income, and 35% are poor or low income using a full Census Bureau standards. So what is that, that this does is it suggests that the scale of the, the poverty problem, right, whatever we mean by that, might be different than we think. And, and maybe we shouldn't think just about the people who are poor, but all those who have low income that may make them near poor, perhaps still in need of assistance. Right? And think about would this be a useful addition to you and your agency when you think about people in your area in need of assistance? more broadly than at just 100% of the poverty line should you be looking at people who perhaps come closer to the poverty line. There are, in fact, other options still if we want to get a more satisfying kind of definition of poverty that gives us more accurate data. And the Census Bureau itself has begun to publish alternative measures that take this into account, that take into account some of the problems with that official measure. And it often will refer to them as the supplemental poverty measure, as the research supplemental poverty measures. Some people will talk about these, the experimental poverty measures. And so in this one, the SPM, the Supplemental Poverty Measure, the census has first created a new way to set the threshold. Right, you can see from what's going on in this chart here. And the short version of what's going on is that it updates that very outdated way to calculate the cost of living that I talked about and gives us something that pretty much everyone agrees is a huge improvement, though there are still plenty of people with complaints. And it even takes into account how the cost of living varies from place to place, a really important kind of improvement. In addition, this new supplemental measure, the SPM, offers a much more thoroughgoing way to calculate the cost of living to begin with. So instead of just looking at the cost of food, which is what that official measure does, it calculates the cost of a much broader array of basic needs. So it includes housing, and it includes utilities, and it includes clothes, among other things. This alternative measure also includes more in the income category. So it actually calculates in the value of things like food stamps, and it counts housing subsidies as household income. And at the same time, it also counts more what's going on in a household in terms of expenses. So it includes the effect of taxes, which, believe it or not, the official measure doesn't include. It calculates in the value of out-of-pocket medical expenditures. So results, we get a much better sense of how much money a household really has a 
available to it to get through the month and to buy food and to buy shelter and so on. To make those changes, they wind up having two big effects. First, they give us new thresholds, right? Instead of that $23,000, right, we now get not only new thresholds, but different thresholds for different people with different kinds of housing arrangements. Since housing costs vary so much, and they constitute such a large portion of household expenses. Right? So it's here that for some groups, the threshold as constructed by the supplemental measure is some $3,000 higher. Net result of this alternative approach. Well, the new approach, the, the new threshold, excuse me, as we might expect, they change the number of people that are living in poverty, right? They raise the percentage, right? This is the official measure for all people. I'm just sort of drawing a little dot here, right? So the 15%, right, is the official measure for 2011, right? If you look at the supplemental measure, it shows, in fact, 16% um, of the population rather than 15% of the population living in poverty, according to the supplemental measure, adding somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 million people to the ranks of people officially living at or below poverty. But what else happens? You the SPM. It shows data on how poverty is distributed among different groups, right? So, so here we see the effect effects on age. Whoops, I'm doing a terrible, terrible, what, I'm going to erase that because that's officially too ugly to live with. Um, uh, and I've got a bad mouse. Uh, there we go. Oh, one more time. Um, well, that's, that's really not a whole lot better, is it? I'm going to live with that. Uh, we're looking at here the effects on age, right? Um, since the supplemental measure, right, it counts in the value of things like the school lunch program. It counts in like things like the earned income tax credit, which have huge effects on children especially. Um, it shows childhood poverty right, significantly lower than the official measure says it is. Contrast, look at what's going on over here. The supplemental measure factors in the expenses of medical costs especially, which even with Medicare, to be much, much higher among older people. The measure tells us that the poverty rate for people over 65 is much, much higher than the official rate tells us it is. These, I think, have really important implications for policymakers, right? Knowing whether poverty among children or poverty among the elderly is the more pressing problem can tell where we should be allocating our resources or where we should be focusing our analysis, right? This could matter in your agencies, too, if you're trying to target scarce resources to the neediest clientele, right? Going back to Schatzschneider, if we define the problem incorrectly, not only may we not be able to solve it, we may not even be able to recognize it. How else could find poverty and then figure out how many Americans are poor, whatever we mean by that. Here's yet one more approach. Focus your attention on the two sort of bold categories on either end. Right? Thinking about poverty as having a threshold, right, is this absolute dollar value cutoff point. But this is arguably a bit more sophisticated with more variation from place to place depending on the cost of living. And a lot of that shows up in housing, as you can see here here that this calculation shows that even in the least expensive place evaluated, Capper, Wyoming in this instance, a family budget needed to support a family of four would be 1.63 times higher than the fill threshold tells us it would be. The most expensive city in this exercise, right, and that's Boston, Dr. Sylvia Allegretto, who did this study, concludes that a family would need 3.38 times the initial threshold to have what it needs to get through the month, to not be poor. So one implication of these kinds of exercises, and you know, most wind up showing more or less similar results, is that actual poverty might in fact be three times higher in some places than the measure would have us believe. Right here may not be the best way to calculate how much income people need to buy. I'm offering 
right here simply as one example. There are lots and lots and lots of these kinds of efforts that people have engaged in. But it's a way to emphasize that it's not necessarily obvious where the line should be drawn and not necessarily easy to figure out what people need. The problem, of course, is, is who gets to decide what's necessary, what necessary expenses are. Right, and we'll turn to that conundrum a little bit down the road. All right, well, let's look at a similar kind of exercise and get you guys involved a little bit in what we're doing. So you look over in your your WebEx screen, um, and, and should, should they be looking in the chat box? You should be finding a link um, to the family budget calculator. Where should they be looking? Uh, have them take a look in the chat, um, and there it is. Robin Stegman just posted it. Well, just scrolled by. Yes. <laughs> so you may have to scroll up a little bit to get to that link. And I will post it again as well. Yeah, that would be great. Um, it is one more time. Right, so follow that link, right, and type in your state and your area name, right, and see what comes up. You're going to get all sorts of what I think is really interesting information, uh, information where you're located. But if you would, then go into the chat board and just share with everybody the housing cost for where you're located, right? So we can look at that. Right. When you're ready, when you've got it, this will take a few minutes, right, as folks sort of, of, of log in. Um, and I think in some of the supplemental materials we'll be sending around later, we'll be sending you some links to some other kinds of calculators that do similar kinds of exercises. Um, so we've got Portland or 757 a month. This is just looking at, at sort of average housing costs, right? Someone's asking sort of about family size. Um, so this is just going to be sort of a 757 in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so who else? Anybody else regular, ready to weigh in on what the monthly housing cost? Um, two bedroom in Mobile, Alabama, 650. Um, to 1,000 in Atlanta. Right? 26 in Indianapolis. 650 in Lincoln, 848 in Minneapolis, 1,000, wow, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 840 in Indianapolis, 600 in Tennessee. Um, someone, one of somebody had 600 with utilities. I am so living in the wrong place. Um, 1,000 for Baltimore, Maryland. Um, wait, what, 1,000 here would be just utilities. Uh, 750, 570 in rural Virginia. Um, I saw 400. There's a 525. 1,000 in Seattle. 1,400 in Burlington, Vermont, 1,100 in Philadelphia. You get the idea. And you should sort of keep keep, keep well, in there um, in terms of housing, right? There's enormous variation from place to place. And the right sort of crude average calculations, they're not taking into account family size, right? And if you've got, you know, a family of four or five kids, Right, and you've got boys versus girls, and you may want to separate out their bedrooms, right? It's probably going to cost you more. You're going to need more space, right? That kind of variation um, is important to think about when we think about, well, what does it cost for a family to live, and where are they, and how do we take that into account? Okay. Um, you should feel free to keep weighing in on that, but we're going to go ahead and tick on and, and look for yet another way to complicate our thinking about poverty and to, to find uh, more ways to highlight the limitations of that official measure. Let's go to the next slide, if we could. So there's another problem with that official measure that we haven't talked about yet, um, and that is that it's a snapshot. Right? And it means that it, it tells us how many people were poor during the time the survey was conducted. Right? That's how the Census Bureau gathers its official poverty data through surveys. They're very sophisticated surveys, but it's, it's, it's opinion surveys. Right? Well, what the official data show that 15% of all Americans were poor in 2011, 16% if we use the supplemental measure. The survey was conducted. But that doesn't tell about the duration of anybody's poverty. Were they poor for all of 2011? For since for one month? We can't know from looking at those data. But one of the things we do know from other research is that people move in and out of poverty over time. So if we step back and look at, say, a two-year period, as this chart does, and ask how many people were poor at all and for how long, we get a very different picture of poverty 
and of how many people it touches. In a two-year period, from 2008 to 2009, 32% of all Americans were poor at least one month. Not percent as the official measure would have it, not 16% as the supplemental has it, but twice that. The way is how many more people are poor than official data suggest tend to be poor for relatively short spells. Right? Note here that while 32.2% of Americans were poor at least once in this two-year period, only 4.6% were poor for the entire two-year period. I think something profoundly important, both about the length of poverty spells and about how many people we can expect to have one. Poverty is a bigger problem than we think, but a different problem than we think do. Use this as an opportunity to ask yourself, this might indicate about the need in your area. How much poverty is there really? Is it short term? Is it long term? Do you know the experience of families in your area and how long on average their poverty spells last? And will knowing that improve your ability now, step back even further, ask how many people are poor, not for a year or not over a two-year period, but over the course of their entire lives. And here's what we find. 50% of Americans are poor for a total of a year or more over the course of their adult lives. A majority of Americans experience poverty. They to do so for short periods of time, a month here, three months there, six months there, but it is, in fact, a common experience in the United States. This also could have some profound possible implications in the way that we think about poverty, since we tend to think of it as something that other people experience. However terrible it may be, it's a minority who are effective and a relatively small minority at that, right? Right? That's not the case. That means we think about poverty, and what does it mean for how we think about who people living in poverty, who the category really is. Now, there are yet more ways we can approach this question of what does it mean to be poor. Now, one of the ways that we've looked at so far to try to measure to count to identify poverty have been absolute measures of income, everything we've looked at so far. Right? That's not actually how most other rich democracies typically measure their poverty, and it's not how international comparisons of poverty are usually done. Often, poverty is identified as having an income of half of what the median income is. Now, median income, that's the midpoint, right? So it means Half people earn more than the median, and half people, half the number of, of, of households earn less, right? So that median is the midpoint, right? So this is asking how many people's income is half of that median. So measure, Paul wasn't 15% in two, this is 2010 here, numbers for 2010 and 2011 um, don't wind up changing. Too much. They were essentially flat for both of those years. Um, wasn't 15% as the official measure would have it? Wasn't 16% as the official measure would have it? It was almost 20%. It was 19% using that half of median income standard. Using that measure, we see how we compare to other rich democracies, and what we find is that we have much higher poverty rates. Right, living below the median. Right. Ask yourself again: Is that a useful way for you to be thinking, or for your agency to be thinking about poverty? Now, still another way: We about what it means to be poor beyond either these absolute measures of income or evaluations of status. Right, comparing people to other families or groups, which is what the median income winds up to. We think about risk. Right. Has, how susceptible are people to be harmed by life events, 
by natural disaster, by job loss, by injury, by illness, by the birth of a child. Right? These, these kinds of life events happen in all countries, to all kinds of people. Well, can people survive them without pushed into economic crisis? That is, maybe it's not just the state of being poor, however you define that, How close families are to slipping into poverty, how fragile they are, how vulnerable they are to some point becoming poor. Right? Maybe maybe if we knew more about that, we more effectively prevent the thing we're calling poverty. In one way, that fragility shows up. Right now, if, if something happens to disrupt a family's income, if some crisis occurs, how long could that family survive before real hardship sets in? And right, almost 20% of American households will be in trouble in under two weeks. They've no room for error, in other words. Right? Maybe, maybe that's a difference we want to think about among families. How much breathing room they have to survive crises or to survive mistakes. And what implications for, for what we think of as anti-poverty programs? Words, should we focus on the prevention of poverty before it occurs by increasing security and stability? Or should we focus on the alleviation of poverty after it has already happened? Now, this also, I think, begins to help us make sense of some of the previous data we saw on the duration of poverty, on how long poverty lasts. Right, The official rate may be 15% or 16 percent if we use the supplemental, but for a two-year period, remember, 32 percent of Americans are going to be poor. Maybe looking at this slide, maybe that help ex helps explain why many American households can get by as long as there are no surprises. But in life, there are almost always surprises. Uh, Sometimes when people see that the United States has higher rates of poverty and higher rates of child poverty and much higher rates of inequality, too, for that matter, than do other rich democracies, they'll suggest that, that well, maybe that's not necessarily all that bad as long as there are opportunities for people to escape their in income level, right, and to rise up out of poverty, right? It's a quality of opportunity that matters most, many people say, rather than that equality of so here's a show about the, the economic mobility available in the United States. And notice here that mobility in the United States is at the low end of this group of rich nations. Now, know that in this chart, a higher number is worse. Because there's a higher likelihood that a son's income will be the same as his father's. With more mobility like Denmark and Canada and Germany, as you can see here, there's a much better chance that things other than family background, things like hard work, things like education, in those places there's a better chance that those other factors will determine your income and a lower chance that it's the family status that's going to determine your fate. There's much more mobility in other rich democracies than there is in the United States, which I think tends to come as a really big surprise to lots and lots of Americans. But this, I think, is another way for us to complicate our thinking about poverty, to think about it as opportunity or long opportunity. All right. Ending off from there, there's, there's one last approach to these questions that I want to touch on today. It's been referred to as the capabilities approach to poverty, and it, it comes typically from an international economist called Amartya Sen, and has argued that, that what poverty really is is a lack of freedom. In poor countries or in poor neighborhoods or in poor families, people have fewer choices available to them and fewer opportunities to live the kind of lives they value, in his words. Is that, that poverty means different things to different people, and that to be poor means to be able to fulfill your potential. 
admittedly a growing body of, of literature on, on what are called happiness studies that seek to find ways to measure people's own evaluations of their well-being, right? That's arguing that that's what we should be interested in. Are people happy? Are they satisfied? Can they live the kinds of lives they want to live, within reason, be able to fulfill their potential? Right. See, instantly, this is, this is a much broader way of thinking about, about well-being than measuring income. This is not actually as new an approach as, as it may appear. Right, so this quote here, which I'll read to you in just a moment from Adam Smith, is one of the founders of modern economics, offered a way of thinking about poverty that I think has more in common with the capabilities approach than it does with, with the official poverty measure. And Smith wrote the following in Scotland in 1776. Everyone is rich or poor according to the degree to which can afford to enjoy the necessary conveniences and amusements of human life. By necessaries, I understand not only the commodities which are indispensably necessary for the support of life, but whatever the custom of the country renders it indecent for creditable people of the lowest order to be without. Linen shirt is, strictly speaking, not a necessary of life. The Greeks and Romans lived, I suppose, very comfortably. They had no, no linen. In the present times, the greater part of Europe, a creditable day laborer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt, the want of which would be supposed to denote that disgraceful degree of poverty which it is presumed nobody can well fall into without extreme bad conduct. This is that poverty is social, cultural, and, and perhaps even emotional, as it is purely economic. In the thinking, not be poor, to be able to live as a full-fledged member of the society you inhabit to be able to participate in the customs of the country. Right. As we get set to wrap up this portion of the presentation, I want to pause for a minute, minute and, and think about what it would mean to take Adam Smith's approach to defining poverty as the custom of the country. What would it mean to take that, that seriously? What are necessaries today, do you think? What's today's equivalent of the linen shirt? So whenever you're ready, um, go back into the chat. Um, I'll try to do a better job of trying to, to read responses as they scroll by far, far too quickly. On smartphones, cell phones, a car. Um, cell phones, cell phones, lots of people, right, feeling, probably tweeting from their cell phones, feeling this is important. Also, computer, cell phone, health care, internet from home, so making a distinction between being able to get to the library, perhaps, having it in your home, um, iPhones. Internet access, transportation, a car, literacy, um, jewelry. Right? And, you know, that's the sort of thing you can imagine people saying, well, that's ridiculous, that's a luxury, why would you need jewelry? But you travel with, with a group of people or you live in a community where, right, where it's common for people to dress in a particular kind of way, to not be able to afford to do that could, in fact, mark you as an outsider in the way Smith is thinking about that. And the potential implications are that that has social costs, right? That has cultural costs, that that maybe has emotional costs. And what does that do then to your ability to survive and to thrive? Like healthy food. Air Jordans, right? Same sort of, of, of logic perhaps could apply. Our education, um, it's a happy hour. Um, but again, I mean, you can imagine, right, that what might look, I mean, again, it sounds silly. You sort of hear that, right? That's ridiculous. Then you think about it. Right? Do you sort of do you exist among a group of people who, who who engage in particular kinds of social rituals? Right. I'm going to sort of sound like a sociologist here for a moment. Do they engage in particular kinds of social rituals through which they form community, through which they form networks for seeking jobs, through which they form other networks that maximize their resources, and does it cost money to participate in those kinds of social rituals? So if you are unable to do that, does that disadvantage you in particular kinds of ways. Right? That's the, the kind of question 
the myth is asking us to think about. So again, I think folks should feel free to continue to weigh in on that and other kinds of questions. Um, we're going to turn to um, Q&A in just a moment. In the meantime, right, because as if things aren't complicated for you enough, right, I want to add yet in a few more questions for you to sort of to think about as we work towards sort of wrapping up. Um, maybe talk a bit amongst yourselves about, about any of these that are of interest. But, but, you know, sort of put more broadly, when we talk about people living in poverty, what you phrase a lot, what does that mean? It all mean the same thing. Condition of poverty, link our ability to think about what it is that people need and are creating space for people to define that for themselves. And people who fall into this category of people living in poverty. Okay, so I'll turn you back to, to Shannon and Suzanne for a moment, um, who have been looking through your questions. Uh, we're going we're gonna to move on to doing some, some Q&A from the WebEx. Is that correct? Stephen, uh, that is, is correct. And I know that actually Robin is standing by uh, and has been keeping really good track of what people have been asking in the Q&A features. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to continue to add to those. Um, we're just going to answer a couple now and any that we aren't able to get to in the next few minutes, uh, we will sure to be sure to try and answer uh, at the end um, when we open up the phone line. So for now, I'm going to turn it over to Robin, who's going to uh, walk us through. Um, so I have um, one question uh, coming from the Q&A. So um, is there a, um, another study set in place in the next couple of years to re-examine the cost of living, food, et cetera, and possible changes in the income threshold? And some feedback on your line. Um, question is, is um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take the, the, the moderator's prerogative and recast the question just a little bit. Um, and ask about are we gonna continue to do the supplemental measure and are people engaged in continuing to think about um, how we can improve upon it. The second part is yes, right? A part of how we got the supplemental measure in the first place is that a group of mostly policy scholars that began um, largely at the University of Michigan in the 1980s, very dissatisfied with the official poverty measure for the reasons that we talked about today and, and a lot more. Um, so started to sort of develop more sophisticated methods of why, in fact, the Census Bureau has moved toward experimenting with those alternative measures is that one of those scholars, Rebecca Blank, at the, who was a dean at the University of Michigan, actually was hired to run the Census Bureau in the early years of the Obama administration. So she brought that kind of lifelong concern about more accurate measures to her work at the Census Bureau. Um, it is unclear, as I watch sort of budgets work their way through, um, whether that money will continue to be allocated in the future. Folks like me, for obvious reasons, are really, really hopeful that we're not only going to continue to fund that supplemental measure, but that we'll also, we'll, we'll maybe two or three supplemental measures, right? Because it's really, really, really hard to calculate cost of living, especially if we're trying to, to take into account variation from place to place. And that's right, profound implications, all sorts of benefits are set, um, social security cost of living benefits benefits are set using a very particular kind of calculation. People are arguing on a regular basis as to whether that's good or could be improved. Um, all sorts of work going on, lots of work going on um, in universities especially, and I'm hopeful that it's continue to, to take place in the Census Bureau as well. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, for our next question, um, this one is coming from um, Barbara, uh, who's asking, uh, it's rare to see poverty measures for adults with disabilities. Do you have any suggested levels of poverty for this population? Uh, it's a question. Um, and I don't, I, we didn't have any in our presentation today, but there are, there are a number of different efforts um, to um, apply poverty rates among people with disabilities. And of course, um, talk about people with disabilities is 
an enormously broad category. Um, so more sophisticated measures start to break down, right, what is it that we mean by disability, which particular kind of disability, because different kinds of disabilities require different kinds of accommodations in order to get through the day. Some of those are much more expensive than others. Um, one of the things that neither the official measure or the supplemental measure does is take into account disability. I think we should. To be honest, um, I don't know how, in the real world, as a practical matter, how to do that. I mean, this is one of the things that I would think would be the virtue of more money on research for better supplemental measures so that we start thinking about, all right, should we have a separate threshold um, for people over the age of 65? Should we have a separate threshold for people with disabilities? Should we break that down by different kinds of disability? Um, we have different thresholds, right? When you start to think about what are the kinds of things that cause it to be much more expensive for one particular kind of family rather than another, how much of that is practicable for us to try to take into account? Again, right, the problem is a nation of 310 million people limited methodological tools, limited data, and limited money to spend on that. So question, I wish I wish we had better data on those kinds of questions. And we'll, we'll turn not to the Census Bureau, but turn to research organizations and scholars that do specific works on disability, if you're looking and getting at those kind of data. Great. Uh, so for the next question we have, um, things we can do is we can go ahead and see if there's any questions on the line. Would you like to ask the – okay, I stick with the Q&A. Right. I think we'll ask another, you know, one or two more questions here, uh, and then um, we'll go through the next portion of the presentation. Um, so our next question is coming from Anna McDaniel. Um, this one is asking about areas experiencing booms. Uh, she's currently in North Dakota, which is lived through the, and living through the old boom that's happening there. Uh, and so obviously booms will have a dramatic impact on housing, food, energy costs. Uh, and especially the area doesn't have price control or price gouging laws. So uh, maybe you can speak a little bit about that. It's fact, it's, it's, we sort of talked very briefly about Detroit earlier being um, – poor Detroit, right – being its own sort of special sort of case study about a, a, a city experiencing a very particular kind of crisis. Um, North Dakota, in, in an entirely different way, is also fascinating in this entirely unique kind of thing. In part because, right, you think record lowest unemployment rate in the entire United States of America right now, right? And this has been true for, shoot, what, four years, five years, six years, something like that. Um, so, well, this is terrific, right? Everything and all sorts of people, right, from all sorts of other states where they have terribly high unemployment rates and people can't get jobs, being into North Dakota in search of work. Um, but as I suspect, I think this was Anna, right, as I suspect Anna knows, um, not enough housing. So my understanding, and I've, I've not unfortunately kept up as much as, as I wish I had now in retrospect on this, um, but that housing is going through the roof, right, that, that, that suddenly you've got people who are finding jobs and then wages are okay, but because of the particular set of circumstances, housing costs are going through the roof because it is such a scarce commodity that you've got this, this, right, this, this awful kind of conundrum, right? You've got a place with, with very low levels of unemployment because of a boom industry, but without the sort of infrastructure required to make it possible for people to take those kinds of jobs. So the outcome is necessarily obvious, right? To sort of think about what's going on with those kinds of families, and if we evaluate well-being, we need to sort of be really specific, right? Thinking about, all right, We've, what are things that we need to be thinking about now in trying to figure out whether people um, would be well advised to move to North Dakota in search of a job or not? Right. There's sort of specific data on hand about that. But it points exactly to the difficulty of getting um, good data for the nation as a whole on these kinds of questions, really messy, complicated kinds of issues. Great. And the last question that I uh, will ask right now, uh, what do you think about what it takes to move out of poverty in your communities? Sort of what have you seen in your experience? 
not be blowing air through my lips is sort of universal sign for for an exceptionally good question and an extraordinarily difficult question, right? Because at some level the question is, well, how do we solve poverty? Um, question implies. The answer to it is very often different in different places for different people at different moments in time, right? And if we if we turn our our commitment to thinking in more complicated ways about how we define poverty, one of the things that should lead us toward is thinking with more complexity about the causes of poverty, recognizing that. Different people find themselves living in poverty for very different kinds of reasons. And a consequence, the solution for each of them may be different, right? Someone who is um, unemployed because they, 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 they live in upstate New York and the sort of the last remaining industry has closed down and there are no jobs available um, and they don't have a car. Right, will allow them to do the hour and a half commute to the place where there are nearest available jobs. Right, that, that's a different kind of problem than someone who is poor because they find themselves injured and unable to work, but are ineligible for one reason or another for disability insurance. That's different from the kind of poverty that's caused by someone who has a sick parent who they have made a commitment to take care of but don't have long-term care insurance, so are trying to, to both provide for the means for the care of that elderly parent who is sick or dying, and figure out how are they supposed to be at work and at home caring for the parent at the same time. I mean, you start to sort of uh, think about people living in poverty as people first. You realize that the answer to that question is very often depend on who we're talking about, depending on where we're talking about, depending on when we're talking about. Uh, great. Thank you so much. I, I think we're going to wrap up this portion of the Q&A session. Uh, and what I'm going to do now, uh, while all of this is still fresh, is uh, point to, to some additional resources that are on the campus. Uh, that can sort of help to continue the conversation um, and just really kind of help you in your community to gain more perspective um, about poverty and some of the things that you can do to kind of address that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my desktop with you. That might take a couple of moments here. Okay. Um, and. Uh, so this is the, the Vista campus, and I'm sure that you have all been here before. This is sort of the screen, the home page that you see after you've logged in. Uh, and if you click on the work section and then scroll down to where it says Poverty in America, uh, this provides a lot of different resources um, on poverty uh, in the United States and offers some ideas about how you can address that. Uh, so I'm going to sort of four uh, different resources here. The first one is the Poverty in Your Community, um, Developing a Community Profile uh, sort of step-by-step -step guide. Um, this really uh, shows you how you can use relevant community data to inform uh, your service projects. Uh, and in it, you'll be able to sort of learn how to develop a community profile, um, which will allow you to get more information about the different people that live in your community, uh, sort of design and deliver uh, impactful service projects, um, and then you know sort of shape how you're going to partner with different community groups. Uh, also, you know how you're going to use that information to enlist support of other people who are already doing similar work in the community, uh, and then also help you to develop additional resources so that the work that you're doing is sustainable. Um, and so this is sort of a great uh, more of a micro view to really work um, at the community level uh, using the data. Uh, next thing to sort of point you to uh, is more of a macro uh, approach. And this is really um, putting some of the national data on poverty in the United States. Uh, it's a series of short video clips. Uh, that Dr. Uh, Pimper has put together using 2010 poverty uh, statistics to show 
how poverty in the United States varies by group and place, uh, and also to direct you to where you can find additional statistics on the most up-to-date um, data. Then, for those of you who are just coming out of um, PSO, uh, you may recall, and even if you were there a few months ago, uh, you might recall having discussed the poverty theories of change uh, with some of your fellow VISTAs. And so in order to provide you with a resource where you can explore these theories further, there's this research article um, where former University of California Davis uh, community studies professor Ted Bradshaw talks about um, how community anti-poverty programs have uh, not so frequently examined the theories that underlie the dominant practices that are addressing poverty. And so this is just a great resource and framework uh, that sort of talks about some of the causes and solutions to poverty and can be a useful tool for you as a VISTA to uh, both analyze and comprehend an the anti-poverty philosophy behind your project uh, and then also to work uh, to address the specific tasks and responsibilities that are in your VAD. Um, so definitely I encourage you to take a look at this one as well. Uh, and then the final resource that I want to point you to are um, some conversations with about poverty uh, with Dr. Stephen Prayer, and there are three different uh, presentations um, on poverty that uh, Dr. Prayer has uh, done in the past, uh, and these are just sort of a great uh, resource to, uh, if you have a few minutes, you know, half an hour, an hour to um, hour and a half on some of them to sound uh, and gain additional perspectives on, you know, poverty, the history of poverty in America, um, who's poor today, uh, and then some of the uh, causes of poverty, um, you know, looking at the economic crisis and how that uh, can affect you uh, or has affected uh, America and the people here and then sort of, you know, give you some insight about what you can do during your business service. I'm so going to stop sharing my, my screen. Oh, I'm no longer sharing my screen. Uh, and I am going to uh, encourage you to take, take a few moments to share your feedback. Uh, you'll be noticing a, an evaluation poll that should be popping up on the right-hand side momentarily. Uh, it really helps us to improve these sessions when you share with us uh, your thoughts thinking about um, what topics we might want to include in future webinars uh, so that um, we can make sure to incorporate your input into the development of these sessions. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. Uh, if you have any further questions or need additional information, you can contact us at vistawebinars at cns.gov. And I also want to uh, encourage you to check out the calendar on the VISTA campus to sign up for uh, two really exciting upcoming webinars. Um, one is Passing the Torch, Ensuring the Continuity of Your Work, uh, and that one is scheduled for Wednesday, April 17th uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, and then uh, to continue some of the conversation today around poverty, there will be a webinar on mining census data to explore poverty in your community, um, so really getting down to the community level again. Uh, and that is scheduled for Wednesday, May 15th, uh, also at 2 p.m. Uh, and so for a complete schedule of all of the upcoming webinars, uh, do visit the ongoing learning page on the VISTA campus. We continue to answer questions for the next 20 minutes or so um, on the webinar, and uh, then Dr. Stephen Pimper will be leaving us to join a live conversation with some VISTAs in New York City. Uh, so some of you are joining us from around the country where you will be able to engage in similar conversations uh, after today's webinar. Uh, and if not, never fear. Uh, we are continuing a virtual conversation via Twitter. Uh, you can join that uh, with the hashtag NoPoverty. Um, and Robin is going to be putting a link to the tweet chat, uh, which is a service that can help you to follow and contribute to the conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to Anna, who's going to tell us how to open the phone lines for questions. Okay. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, press star 1 on your phone 
Unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. If you need to withdraw your question, press star 2 in one moment, please, for any incoming questions. Great. As we're waiting. Uh, we're going to turn it over to New York City, where uh, we have some VISTAs who are sitting and are going to ask some questions. So now I'm going to pass it over to Kate. It seems that we uh, don't have Kate right now, but we will work to uh, get her. So what we're going to do is we're going to just um, start with the Q&A that we have and while we're waiting for phone calls to come in from the line. And it looks like the first one um, is going to be from Kara, uh, who is asking, I'm wondering if poverty measures ever to take into account debt. We may have lost work. Uh, hopefully, they will be coming back shortly. I have a couple questions on the phone. Let me know when you're ready. Great. Um, we will go ahead and take some of those questions, um, and we will do our best to answer them. And if not, um, we will be able to, make, to get answers for you as soon as we can. So why don't we take the first question? Okay. This question comes from Tammy Webster. Your line is open. Hi, Tammy. Hello? Yep. What's your question? So I put a question in the in the Q and A section. It says that the slide where it shows that three thirty two point two percent of Americans live in poverty at least one month, um, and forty four point two percent for the whole two years. Um, that's a slide that was before. I was just wondering, is there data on how that looks when broken down into racial categories, and if so, how does it look or affect the data? Okay. Um, um, hold on one second. We have a Robin's going to answer that question for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, um, I answered actually in the Q and A. There is a, a link to census data, census and um, there's actually a resource there that has that information um, broken out by race. So if you pull up that, that link, um, you'll be able to see, and I will post it in the chat. You'll be able to see. Um, the differences that are there. So that make a it does affect it in some way. Yes, it does. It does affect um, the poverty rate race in the there is that correlation. So um, if you look at the census data, you can get kind of a more clear picture than we can pull up um, in the couple of minutes we have here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anna, do we have another question on the line? Yes, our next question comes from Terry Kolbeck. Your line is open. Hello, Dr. Pimper. I'd like to change the question that Native Americans on reservations are actually impoverished. If we look only at the 75% of people who don't have jobs, certainly we consider that. But when you look at quality life, as you were talking about, Housing is provided, food commodities and food stamps provided. Transportation here locally is great. You are given free land and you use it. You have health care free. There's a great transit uh, system. You get government uh, payments. You get uh, casino payments. And people don't move uh, from uh, the reservations. They're moving back to it. Why? We just have two years of poverty. We have generation after generation. Why, if the quality of life is so bad, it perhaps isn't so bad, and uh, it's something to challenge the norm way of thinking. I just want your opinion. That excellent question. Uh, I am afraid that we have lost uh, no connection with Dr. Pimpin, so we're trying to get him back. 
Um, and so we'll certainly ask uh, your question. And if we're not able to get him back on the line today, we will certainly follow up with you um, via email. Thank you. Thank you very much. A more question from Katie Olson. Your line. Okay. Great. Yeah, I'm here from Louisville, Kentucky. And I was just wondering if you guys or Dr. Pimpare would be able to explain why things like SNAP benefits and housing subsidies are included in, in earned income. Because it seems to me those are very temporary fixes, especially government uh, assistance um, for problems that are very systemic uh, for people who are living in impoverished situations. And it seems like, at least for me, the definition of poverty or the lack thereof would be something where you would be reliant and not reliant on benefits from handout from government agencies or organizations um, to make your monthly payments or your uh, to support your family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, that is a wonderful question. Uh, and um, I believe that Kate perhaps has joined us. Kate, are you on the line? So we're still having audio uh, issues with our um, folks over in New York, and so because we want to make sure that we can uh, answer all of your questions, um, it looks like what we will do is we will continue um, the conversation on Twitter. So certainly we encourage you to um, join that conversation using the hashtag NoPoverty and uh, we will be sure to follow up uh, with any of your questions. Um, we'll get answers to those and then send um, out an email with the answer to those questions. So I really appreciate it. Uh, and there's a lot of great conversation that's been happening today. Uh, and we apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but we will get answers to all of those questions um, and be in contact. So do join us if you can for the tweet chat um, and keep an eye out for an email, uh, which we should be able to get out to you um, sometime next week. Thank you very much, and uh, have a wonderful day.